the Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at www.mtsu.edu slash CEM. Hello, everyone. As we start our second session of the Fall ELL Collaborative here today at MTSU, we're offering new teachers an opportunity to ask questions and get feedback from those with years of experience of teaching English learners. So today this session is just a Q&A session and the Q&A will be facilitated by Dr. Chris Tennyson who is an experienced ESL teacher and administrator in Rutherford County Schools. She currently works as an EL teacher at Riverdale High School. Dr. Tennyson would you join me on screen please? Hello, Dr. Tennyson. Hello. All right, uh, thanks for being with us today. We, uh, some questions have been presented to us that um, are relevant to the work of new teachers, and we encourage new teachers throughout this Q&A, please continue to add the questions to the chat, and we will get those questions to Dr. Tennyson. But um, Dr. Tennyson has brought some questions herself that she'd like to address first. And we will address as many questions as we can during this session. So, Dr. Tennyson, thanks so much for your time and perspectives today. And let's get started. So my first question uh, that I have run across a lot, and I have to read this. Uh, we have a lot of newcomers coming um, after school started. What are the, some of the things that I can do to help acclimate them quickly? So oftentimes we create these wonderful plans um, and we have just a few students at the beginning of the year and then we have students that can either come trickle in one or two at a time or they can come a lot. Um, many of us had a lot of students come um, at the end of August, the beginning of September. And so one of the things that we have to do is sometimes we have to step back as our uh, students change, especially if there's a lot coming in at one time and go back to the beginning of the year strategies. And we have to look at how those students, um, we acclimated those students in the beginning. Um, one of the other things we can do is we can assign a buddy. So that student gets a buddy, whether it's a native language speaker or a um, the same language as them. And so that speaker, uh, that student can help them acclimate quickly. Um, hey, remember what it was like for you, can you support the student as they um, come into school? Uh, there's just a lot of challenges, um, but my, uh, my big recommendation for that is grace for yourself and grace for the students, and then to make sure we're supporting the teachers as well. Um, sometimes they can get three or four new students in a week um, that are ESL students, and that can be overwhelming. Um, as a new teacher, uh, just continue to build those relationships and we're going to continue to talk about that and the importance of those relationships. So I'm going to look at my second question. Unless Dr. Clark, did you have anything to say to the, add to that? No, but you know, when, when you talk about buddies for the uh, new students, um, I also think of uh, buddies, uh, aka mentors for new teachers. So I'm hoping that new teachers also have a mentor or a support person that they can talk to in, in that first year. So please, um, what's the next question? Okay, well, let me address that buddy situation first. Yeah. You are not, not, that is so key for new teachers to have their own buddy and to make sure that uh, they have someone to support them. And it does not have to be an ESL teacher. Sometimes we're the only ESL teacher in the building and we just need to find that one person that can help keep us going uh, because there's so much information flying at us and to find that one buddy to help us. That's a great point. Thank you, Dr. Clark. All right, my second question was, um, 
So we are, our focus is always on student growth and um, in the first session, which was phenomenal, um, the, the teachers at Northfield shared lots of great ways to have your students grow in their language acquisition. So then the next question comes, we all know that testing is so important, whether we want it to be or not. And so um, how do we prepare our students for the actual WIDA um, test that will happen in the spring? Um, there aren't a lot of practice items out there, and so we want to make sure that they feel have test comfort and test familiarity. And so the question really is, what do I do? Because there aren't a lot of uh, test uh, prep questions out there. Well, um, one of the things is uh, make sure they're getting a lot of experience being on the computer, speaking uh, into the mic, speaking. Um, of course, a lot of us use Flipgrid to help us with our students, and there's a way to moderate that so that um, if they're worried about other students watching their videos and they don't want to have their videos watched, um, you can keep those private. Um, just a lot of experience with them typing on the computer uh, for the writing part. And then whether it's on the computer or not, you need to give them timed tests. So the test is timed and, and once they hit start for their speaking, um, they only have so much time. And so kind of give them skills that allows them to take some pre notes for speaking. Um, and that's key. And then for the writing and the listening, especially make sure that they know that there's um, can be a limited time for a response, especially for listening. And they will see a little clock that clocks down that ticks down. So if there's some way for you to mimic that so that they know that they have to speak quickly. Um, and uh, I can't um, emphasize Flipgrid enough. So. You know, it's it's so helpful when we are when we know we're going to be in a timed assessment situation to practice that timing well before the assessment to get really comfortable with that. So, yeah, that's those are great ideas. I think one of the weaknesses we have with the WIDA test for students is they're um, they get scared when they see the clock. Yeah. Uh, for the listening part and then also for the speaking they are just not as comfortable uh, speaking into a computer or something like that and so um, the more familiarity that they can have with that the 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 greater that they have a chance of showing what they've learned um, so and, and you know there there are a number of ways uh, in a classroom uh, this idea you know for new teachers to to play timing games that are fun and they're timed and they're fun, but it kind of, it can get students' brains in, in the mode of saying, okay, this is timed, now I'm on a time. So I have to think and operate and focus and, um, but to do it, you know, in, um, in ways that are not high stakes, to give them just the practice of letting their brain function in a timing situation. Yes, all right, next question. Yes. that I had thought about. <clears throat> All right, so in high school and middle school especially, we have a lot of diverse students. Um, even if they all speak Spanish, they don't all come from the same country um, and they don't all have the same um, educational experiences. And then sometimes we mix several different cultures together. Um, with, you have Hispanics and Arabics and some African students and some others. We struggle sometimes to get them all to work in a collaborative manner or sometimes even just to respect each other. And uh, Dr. Carol Salva, who wrote Boosting Achievement, if anyone has ever read that book, is um, <clears throat> does a great uh, activity, which you can do any point in time during the year. Um, but you create a class contract. So the students agree together how they will um, behave, how they will treat each other, how they will treat you, and then you agree how you will treat them. And so this really supports their, um, their collective understanding of what is expected. And yes, we can all say, well, we're just going to do respect, but what does respect look like if you are in Arabic woman speaking to a Hispanic man when your culture kind of 
uh, has different definitions for the male and role and female um, interactions. Um, I and so talking about new students coming uh, this year, um, right around the beginning of September, we had about 25 newcomers enter Riverdale High School. All of them did not enter all of my classes, but one of my classes com almost completely turned over and we went back and re redid our contract so that our students could understand the expectations of the other students in the class and my expectations as well. Um, we know that there's an emphasis on posting rules. So if you can agree, the students can agree on those rules together, then it becomes a much easier management system. Um, you just say, hey, remember you agreed to this or hey, remember um, you agreed to that. Now you're saying, but my students don't speak English. So you do the best you can um, have other students translate for them, um, translate the questions yourself. Um, and uh, use pictures if you need to uh, so that you can understand how that respect looks and that's really the most important part you know um, that the you're talking about cultural norms and uh, classroom norms but the the idea that we are crossing cultures in a classroom the norms, the establishing of norms and agreed upon behaviors and mutual respect is absolutely key. And you know, we're in November right now and uh, this can still be done even though we're not at the beginning of the year because we can, you know, we can just have the class meeting where we redefine. So what are we doing and what are the rules and, and that? The importance of the norms and and the importance of considering the multicultures in setting the norms so thanks for that um, let's let's move on dr tennyson and uh for whatever you have other questions you have right now i don't have any more questions i'm sorry so um I, i'd like to revisit something that was asked this morning um New, when new teachers have entered a school and they are a uh, new kid on the block, so to speak, how in their first year do they become part of the team, do team building with coworkers? How do they uh, find their group, find their supporters, find their mentors and find their place? in the faculty and staff and administration of the school. Would you would you talk about that? Um, yes, one of the most important things is they need to be visible. Um, it's easy as a new teacher to get overwhelmed with all you have to do and stay in your classroom. But it's extremely important that you get out and you are in the uh, in a middle school situation, a high school situation that you're in the halls that you find that time to eat lunch with other teachers if you can, that you um, uh, go to those faculty meetings and don't sit in the back of the room, but sit among teachers that you are gonna be working with um, and make yourself visible so that they can see you. Uh, I think um, one of the biggest challenges is to find that time um, if at the beginning of the year and you're an elementary teacher and you haven't quite scheduled uh, all of your classes yet, perhaps try to go around to different PLCs and introduce yourself. Um, look for those time periods when you can meet other teachers. And it's not about necessarily discussing students, it's about you introducing yourself and the other teachers uh, introducing themselves to you. Now, you want to, you you will have people around you in that in that hallway that you're in and um, you will uh, hopefully your school will have assigned you a teacher buddy um, maybe one that's an ESL but maybe one that's not sometimes it's nice to have a buddy that is not in your department so that you can ask those questions that don't necessarily have anything to do with your curriculum but just like um, what do I do when I'm absent or um, what is the procedure if I uh, don't um, have such and such done on time? How do I reach out to my principal? Um, email is great, but we know there are other more personal ways for us to communicate with our fellow teachers. Uh, 
just finding that person to say, I'm so frustrated today. It's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to go, oh my gosh, I don't know what is going on in my job right now, but still love your job. Um, and so finding those times to be interactive with your fellow teachers is very important, especially if you are the only ESL teacher in your building. You need your fellow teachers and you will you will find those people that are part of your tribe, as we say it, and you will be able to communicate with them and be a part of that, uh, find a group that is you can connect with, hopefully. Absolutely. Um, you know, as we know, uh, our, our school colleagues can, uh, become, can become our second family because we spend lots of time together. So uh, those are good suggestions. Um, we have a question here. Um, this teacher is new to ESL this year. Uh, this teacher was a gen ed teacher, but now they have uh, gotten certification and transitioning now to be an ESL teacher. What is, what are a couple of pieces of advice? What's the number one piece of advice you would give to teachers transitioning from a gen ed classroom to an ESL position? Well, this is, I would, I started out, the only thing I've ever taught is ESL. So I have to be very transparent with that. But um, I think one of the hardest things is um, learning to let go of all the planning. Um, yes, we plan, but for ESL teachers, um, there's a lot of unexpected things that arise. For instance, we have this great plan done and then we realize that our students don't quite have the background or the language level to uh, access everything that we want them to access. And sometimes we have to take a step back and um, say, uh, okay, what is it I need to do to make them successful? And then to kind of go back to new students coming in all the time, sometimes you do a great lesson and you're all prepared. And then that next day, you have several new students or even just one new student sitting in that group and you realize um, there are other things that need to arise. So um, flexibility um, is the greatest thing that you can do. Um, and yes, we need curriculum maps um, even for ESL and yes, we need to have those plans, but we also need to understand that flexibility is probably one of the most important things that we can do. Um, and at coming as a gen ed teacher, everything is laid out for us. Um, we often have our curriculum material chosen for us. Um, and in ESL, that is not always the case. Uh, we often have to find some of our own curriculum. And so when people like Luke share their, their information, that's a great asset. Um, or when you, if you're not sure what you're doing, uh, I would look at the scope and sequence for your grade level and try to see what you are doing in the classroom can support them. Um, so being a being a gen ed teacher, uh, the nice thing is you get to go from large groups to small groups and sometimes you find it doesn't take you as long to get through a lesson because you don't have as many students in order to work with and sometimes you aren't planning enough and so you may need to over plan and make sure that you have enough um, uh, ways to to integrate with that material that you're trying to teach yeah so i'm not sure if that answered the question and um i um i know it it begins to address it it's a big question um it has many different responses but but another thing to consider is uh, typically gen ed teachers serve children who come to the classroom with English fluency. Absolutely. And so just to put on a new lens of, in looking at your students to understand that, that when they come to us, that fluency may not, is likely not there. So just to reframe how we begin teaching with students or how we continue in the context of the lack of English fluency. And I, th I think, you know, that is yeah. also a, a significant difference. Absolutely. To change your mindset of, oh, this is a fourth grade lesson. I have fourth graders, but they may not have enough English language 
acquired yet so that to understand that that lesson or that that thing that's why you have to be flexible and you have to go oh wait this is too hard for them or sometimes oh wait this is too easy maybe i need to to make it a little more challenging so okay we've got another question a couple more that have come in here this teacher says that we have one student who is really struggling with culture shock still. Mondays are rough, but the rest of the week, she is better. She referring to the student. How can we help these students cope with their culture shock? Uh, depend, Krashen addresses this uh, with the silent period um, and other things. Um, Wow, that's a really great question. Um, so Mondays are difficult, but probably because she has been at home all weekend. So finding that buddy, number one, who can hopefully communicate with them and their L1 is going to be important so that they can make sure that they understand the in their first language. Um, and then w sometimes we have to step back. And we have to uh, respect that space and give them that space. Um, the more, sometimes the more we push them, the greater the culture shock may be. Um, but one of the greatest things that helps students with that acclimation to American schools is routine. Making sure that we have that same routine every time they come in our classroom, every time they come in the building. If Mondays are difficult for them, um, as you know, make sure that that teacher or that or you be the one to greet them and help them remember to reacclimate to their surroundings and support them um, and or just know that Mondays are hard. And as you uh, work through that, respect that Mondays are hard for them and help them um, help them through that. Uh, culture shock is true for all of us. It's not just an it's not just an ESL thing. Sometimes you can move from one part of the country to another and, and get uh, have culture shock. Sometimes you can be an adult. Right. Um, and so we just all have to remember uh, to respect people's spaces. Um, we want to encourage them to participate and perform, but sometimes we have to step back and let them find their themselves within the new culture. Um, and it's really hard sometimes for kids that come from different cultures, but to find a buddy, um, to give them that routine, those are important parts of, of helping them feel more comfortable. And um, relationships, as you build that relationship with them, as their friends build that relationship with them, and as their classroom teacher builds that relationship with them, they will begin to feel more and more comfortable. You know, that Monday morning culture shock um, is also true when we have students who leave the school learning environment, go into a home non-learning environment, and then return to school on Monday back to the learning environment. So this, this idea of the Monday shock is not, as, as you said, not unique to English learners. And I know um, an, another effective way is to First of all, greet them in the moment, but then say, now, do you remember what we did Friday? Or uh, tell me what you remember from last week. And so that brings their brain back to last week to bring continuity into this week. Um, so um, I'm, I'm glad this question was asked because it has really broad application uh, in terms of the culture shock. Um, so thanks. Well, the, the culture shock when they, whenever they return from a long break too, yeah. um, it, and so sometimes we have to plan activities around reacclimating students to the to the classroom, especially after fall breaks, Thanksgiving breaks, all of those breaks that we get. So yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, let's see. We have another question from a new teacher. What advice do you give us on ILP development? Okay, so ILP development is definitely a collaborative process. Um, you have to use test scores. There are many things around that. Using the WIDA, even though WIDA may be moving away from can -dos, you can't, the can -dos help you um, understand both what they can do now and then what we're working toward. Um, 
don't overwhelm yourself with adding a, a lot of goals at one time. Uh, pick, look at their WIDA scores, um, get to know the child and pick one or two domains uh, to concentrate on for let's say the first semester. So oftentimes it seems that uh, writing and speaking are those domains that, that need the most growth. So let's say, what? how can I connect those two, writing and speaking, and what can I put in my ILP that will be um, tangible goals that they can reach? And we have to make them tangible and measurable so that we know that we can see that progress. And we also have to put it in terms where the classroom teacher and the other teachers in your building who are working with this student can do something to help them grow in that area. Um, Give yourself grace if you're a new teacher. Um, I don't know everybody's numbers, but I will say uh, this year for us, um, sometimes getting out the ILPs was a challenge uh, because we did receive so many newcomers, 25 newcomers in a very short span of time. And so we had to, we think, oh, well, creating a, a goal for a newcomer is easy because, um, oh, they're just, they just need to learn how to speak. Um, that's not always true. Uh, we need to make sure that we have some sort of literacy and listening goal um, going along with that. But um, just taking your time, thinking of one thing for that student may need to grow on and uh, making sure, as uh, Luke said, it's always based in the data. Um, so making sure that you're looking at the data that you know, not just their WIDA data, but also sometimes if you have it available, uh, their um, their TCAP data, their EOC data. So. Okay. All right. Um, we have another question. I've heard this question a lot over the years, but it's particularly uh, um, important for new teachers time to do paperwork so what advice suggestions do you have to new teachers first year of teaching and paperwork um just know that your time on task may not just be the hours that are at school and that's a part of the reality of education um but sometimes uh you have to spend some time I don't rec recommend hours and hours, but sometime out of your school hours doing the paperwork. Give yourself um, a routine. You too need a routine. Uh, one of my coworkers always spends Tuesday afternoons after school, only Tuesdays, he tries to get it done on Tuesdays, doing the ESL paperwork that we need to do. So he will go through files, he will look through and see um, what students have come that need an ILP, what students um, come that they have information that needs to be shared with central office. Um, uh, we, t we keep up with our, in high school, we keep up with our students' failures, not only at the end of a quarter, but we uh, check those failures throughout um, the nine weeks. So uh, we set aside um, one day a week where we look through uh, student failures and usually we know which students are have that challenge of getting all their work in and passing their classes and so we don't have to look at every child. Um, we have our we take time in class sometimes to look at those failures. Um, we let some, as the stu older the students get, sometimes we can have them support their own selves um, with, with passing and failing. And I, that's because that's part of our responsibility in our paperwork is we have to know which students are failing their classes, not just at the end of the nine weeks. That's, a, that's too late sometimes. Um, but really choosing what day a week could you come in early or stay late? so that you can find that time for paperwork. Um, yes, we do have contract hours, but sometimes we can't get everything done within our contract hours. The worst thing we can do is go two or three weeks and then someone says, well, have you done this? And you're like, oh, I totally forgot about that. I'm a list person. 
make a list of, of those things when people say this needs to be done. Have a running list of things that need to be done so that you know, well, that one day a week that I've set aside that I will get that done then and tell people um, on Tuesdays I do paperwork and I will get back to you. Um, for those of us with um, we have uh, over a hundred students at our school and so sometimes we have to um, uh, take some time uh, and work together. Um, divide and conquer. If you have a team, don't do it all yourself. Make sure that your team is collaborating so that you all are um, able to uh, divide uh, up the responsibilities and one person isn't doing it all. Um, and then help each other remember, hey, did you do this this week? that you should have done so. Uh, but but admitting, I think the biggest part of paperwork is admitting you cannot get it all done in school hours and that and setting a routine for yourself to get it done. Yes. So we have uh, one more question and then we'll wrap up the session. And so this last question that just came in is. Teacher said that I push in in the classroom and pull out my kids in the afternoon. I kind of feel like an education assistant when I'm pushing in. Any advice? Um, so the research says that push in when there's co-planning done together um, is one of the most effective ways for ELs, um, especially those of are um, emerging and, and those above the entering level. Um, it is very important though that you co-plan and co-planning can be through emails, it can be through texts, it can be through other things. Um, if you, building a relationship with that teacher that you're working with is key so that you can know how you can support her through uh, teaching. Um, and sometimes we need to advocate for ourselves. Hey, I want to do some of the teaching in this classroom. What is one area in this classroom that maybe I can support you in co-teaching? And sometimes it can be the bell work. Um, I come in every day and I do the bell work and I work with all the students in the classroom uh, while that other teacher is taking attendance. That's one thing that can happen in the, the push-in situation. The other thing can be um, when you are doing group work, um, you go around and you pick a group that you feel that you can best support. It doesn't have to be the newcomers. The newcomers could be working with that classroom teacher and you can pick that intermediate mixed group where you have a group of ELs and um, the regular ed students sitting in a group together and you work with that group and that's your group every time or you switch up groups that you work with. But um, communicating with that classroom teacher and asking for some of the responsibility of that that classroom here's the biggest pushback that you may get back on that well the teacher is worried because those test scores belong to her um, and i know we don't like to talk about that um, but um, you can reassure her that with that second adult in the classroom and if you plan with her or she helps by sharing her plans and saying i want you to teach this part of the lesson today or he um, then you can uh, then begin to integrate yourself into the classroom. Um, but you can't wait until you walk into that classroom and say, I want to help today. It has to be something that is planned ahead of time. Um, but uh, definitely co-planning, um, and there's a lot of, of great work out there uh, um, on co-planning and how important that is. Co-planning co is co-teaching. Yes, um, yes. And so um, I want, I can't emphasize that enough. You have to work with that classroom teacher ahead of time to see where you can support them and then find that routine where you do the same thing every class. So, or what the teacher needs you to do. So um, we're coming to the end of this session, but another, uh, another question came in and uh, I don't see it now, <laughs> but uh, the question was uh, something essentially. When high schoolers um, are failing because they are LEP. What uh, what are some suggestions you have? And, okay. and we're going to wrap this up and we may be able to address this somewhat with Dr. Stacy's uh, presentation in the afternoon. Absolutely. I am sure that he can address this. Yeah. Um, 
first of all, if they're failing because they're limited English proficient and there is, we had a fire alarm, I have to stop. I'm at school, the fire alarm just went off. Dr. Tennyson, to, thank I'm sorry. And thank you for adhering to the safety practices. Sorry. So we'll see you sorry. another time. So sorry. Go and be safe now. <laughs> okay. Um, again, uh, my fellow teachers, we have to be adaptable, right? <laughs> uh, Dr. Tennyson, thanks so much. Mm -hmm.